Before we start today's roundtable, I want to give special thanks to Chexter, our group sponsor. Chexter has become well known in the recruiting industry by providing a platform that easily captures reference checks in the hiring process. I myself have been a customer of theirs for years. I use a reference checking tool for all of my new hires. However, Chexer has now released a new product suite called Insights. This new product suite is really what has excited me to have Chexer as the group sponsor. With Insights, the Chexer platform now covers employees from cradle to grave and not just reference checking. Starting when they apply, going to offer, through onboarding, then covering their work at your company and then to the end with exit interviews. It's an easy to use, easy to understand way of giving and getting feedback from your peers. Checks your simple goal to build more productive and passionate teams. Now, if this concept of getting insights from your peers regarding your work sounds familiar, it should because that's the simple goal of this group. Connecting, communicating, collaborating. Support me, support the group, Follow the link below, recruiting.work forward slash Chexter. This will take you to a landing page to sign up for a quick demo. If you are just thinking about automating your reference checking process, it'll be well worth your time. But I encourage you to check out the full Insights suite. I'd love to find out if you feel the way I feel about it. Now let's get to today's roundtable. Thank you everybody for attending episode 69 in Let's Talk Recruiting, where uh, TA professionals and peers get a, across the industry get together and talk about various topics in our industry. Usually it's kind of like a, a how-to or best practices in our industry. Today's topic, what is the current job market for recruiters, is going to be different than our normal type topic. It's kind of like the, the state of the world for us in recruiting and where the world is kind of. It, I wish, usually I'm excited for these conversations. This one's a little tough one because the world is it's, it's a tough world out there right now. But nonetheless, I thought this would make for a great conversation. So let's jump into today's topic. I am going to stop sharing that screen. And again, today, what is the current job market for recruiters? In the chat area, again, I encourage you, I think this is a great group discussion. I think everybody has their stories. When you signed up for the audience, I did, hey, I did ask everybody, hey, what's it like out there for you? It wasn't really a clear situation to me from all the answers. Some it was good, some it was bad, some it was picking up, some it was staying normal. I will post this session on our, our website, recruiting.work, and I'll add in everybody's answers that they gave in there. If you're curious, I'll get that up later today. But I just thought it was interesting, like there's no clear sign. So it's, okay, maybe it's per industry or what have you, or it's just... Uh, one, one answer was, it's tough being a pimp. I couldn't agree more. It's a tough world out there. So what we're going to do is kind of our round table. Uh, Stephen, we're going to start off with you. If you kind of want to start the conversation from your perspective. Great. Thank you, Sean. Hello, everyone. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I am in Chicago. Um, I've been in talent acquisition for over 20 years. I'm also um, in other areas of human resources. So um, I bring that cross-functional aspect and being able to partner and collaborate uh, across the business in HR. Um, I am currently um, in transition working on a contract for uh, a company called Painters USA, which is a national industrial and commercial painting and floor solutions company, uh, and I'm in charge of recruiting for them. So um, what I'm seeing from the, so I'm, I'm both a job seeker and recruiting um, at the same time. Um, so uh, interesting situation on that. What I really wanted to, to mention is that the job market is there, right? It is open, active for recruiters. Um, what I encourage you to do as a recruiter is, recruit, is look for jobs like you recruit for jobs. So, you know, it's, um, you know, apply, continue applying, continue networking, Right. Um, I have a saying, and that's cast your net as wide as you can and you're bound to catch a fish. Do any and everything you can, um, even um, as a recruiter, to look for work and act as a, as a job seeker like you would want your candidates to act. Follow up. Right. We all talk about the importance of that. But what I talk about is the rarity of that. So to really make yourself stand out, make yourself different is use all the resources you have to do the research and follow up on those positions that you're aware of, do the exploratory interviews, contact cold, you know, cold calling into companies that are of interest to you, all those types of things. Actively do your job search because the market is active. 
Um, like Sean mentioned, we got a lot of responses from people on, on where they see things going on right now. Um, I'm seeing both positions at a corporate level. Um, I'm seeing recruiters. I'm seeing talent acquisition managers and director positions posted out there. Um, but we all know a lot of times by the time those jobs are posted, they've already got some traction going on with regards to recruiting for those roles. So try to get into those, those underlying um, avenues to find out about positions. Work with staffing firms, right? Uh, to, I have never been in a staffing firm as an employee, but I've used a lot of them both in helping sourcing candidates and in my job search. Um, it's a great, great venue and avenue. Um, I'm seeing so some of the people posted that they're seeing a lot of positions that are contract, contract to hire versus regular. I'm seeing a variety of those posted, but don't veer away from contract opportunities. First of all, it helps fill a gap, right, in your employment. It gives you experience and it opens a door to a possible full-time opportunity for you. Um, so that's my take. Anybody want to comment on those things? Hey, real quick before we get panel comments, I'm going to drop in a poll for the audience to kind of give it an idea of where everybody's at. Uh, let me get that going before we jump into that. There you go. So it's kind of addresses, it follows what you're saying, Stephen, about the situation if you are out there currently working. Uh, sorry about that. As, as we're discussing, people in the audience, please fill out that poll. Sorry. And, was, and great point, Sean. So this question number two is the open to work feature. Um, I do use it. It's great. You know, it, it just highlights you a little bit more, um, but also making sure that your profile is open and available, right, for recruiters. So there's that privacy feature where you can make your profile open. So if you're actively looking, um, I encourage you to also change that privacy feature to make your profile open and active for recruiters to find. And free in-mails. There's that feature too where... And most recruiters who have LinkedIn recruiter have plenty of in-mails, but I always say, hey, turn that on when you can, just in case. Quick question around when we talk about contract, you mean working as a contracted recruiter on somebody's W-2 payroll, right, versus going to work for an agency or? Either a W-2 or a 1099. Got it. Um, not, not even a 1099, right? Um, if you're properly use, using that, um, that work status, um, you know, using it smartly with regards to your finances and things like that. But, um, but again, uh, some companies may not have the headcount right now because of, of the business. Um, they may not be sure. They may want to try it before they buy it. So it's almost like you're, you're your own temp, right? Also, don't be afraid to go through a staffing firm as a temp. Again, it's getting your foot in the door. So I worked at a furniture store here in Chicago before this contract position. And, um, and I had a HR coordinator that I brought in through a temp service. And he worked as a temp for four months and they hired him full-time as an HR manager. So again, it's giving them the opportunity to see your success and you prove yourself um, and get paid for it. So definitely, you know, don't close the door. Oh, I'm only looking for full-time work. Open yourself up if you can. I realize some people need, you know, benefits and time off and, and those kinds of things that you don't get if you're a 1099. Uh, some staffing firms, even as temps, um, after a certain amount of time, they will provide you with benefits. Um, so look at that as an opportunity too. Yeah. And then everybody, I just posted the poll results. Has everybody seen on the screen just to confirm that? I will say I'm surprised that 51% said they're not actively looking. I thought that would be higher for today's topic, but interesting enough. Uh, to, to Stefan and Matt and Rachel, any, any comments to what Steve was saying? Absolutely. Um, I, I just the open to work, turning that on alone and you know putting a little green circle around your, your profile picture. I noticed within, it was less than 24 hours uh, a complete change. Uh, I thought I had it turned on. I didn't. Um, but I uh, over. I would say definitely over fifty percent increase in recruiters contacting me for roles that I haven't applied for. So they're sourcing, you know, candidates. 
Um, so that was, was a huge game changer for me. Um, and I just to pile on um, to what Steve said about, so I have recruiting experience working at the agency level, but also corporate recruiting. So I just want to emphasize what he said. That is so true. I mean, I've been spending my job search currently searching myself, <laughs> leveraging my network, and then, you know, reaching out to my, my agency friends and partners and, and checking in with them. And it's, it's, at the end of the day, the market's super, it's slow right now, but um, it's been reassuring to talk to other recruiters um, and get an honest answer and look at not only like my resume, but just like what they're seeing in the market and what's changed. Yeah, I think- Steven brought up an interest, oh, go ahead. No, oh, go ahead, Seth. I, I thought Stephen brought up an interesting point to not limit yourself and, you know, explore the opportunity of being in a contract role. Because a lot of places you have the ability to go from contract to becoming a, a full-time team member with a lot of organizations. Um, and I, I thought it was kind of ironic because as I've recently turned on the open to discussing other opportunities on my own LinkedIn profile, I have not selected open to contract. Um, why i think maybe there's some fearfulness and a lot of people are like well it's a contract it could end at any time it's not permanent um you brought up the point about benefits um could be an issue for some folks as well now i thought about that to myself for a second and when i first started working for the rock family of companies after my internship i was a contract employee and i didn't even really think about that i was a contracted through a company called aerotech um, i had to do that for about four or five months to earn my stripes and was offered a full-time role. And it's, you know, been almost nine years later and I've grown exponentially with the company, which has been great, but it had me look a little bit internally and um, to Rachel's point, you know, kind of learning about yourself. And it's like, well, wait a minute, I'm not open to this opportunity, but that opportunity is kind of how I got where I'm at today. So maybe I'm limiting myself and some potential right. exposure to positions I might be interested in by saying no to a contract role. So I think that's something that I could be more open to potentially revisiting. And a lot of these companies, I know for a fact that Aerotech and I'm sure some of their bigger competitors, some of the tech systems out there, they're providing benefits as well. They're not just bringing you on in a contract role and you don't have benefits sink or swim. A lot of these companies are providing benefits for full-time team members, some of them even for part-time team members. So for those of you in the search, to Stephen's point, like don't kind of close your, your net, if you will, on what you might be open to, because that could present a bigger opportunity down the role. I know for myself, I'm going to Probably take a bigger look into that after we get off this call. And, and I think really, that, you know, sorry, Matthew. Uh, this is uh, this is my first contract position, right? Um, I'm fortunate in that, from a benefits perspective, I'm in a good place. Uh, but I understand not everybody is. So, you know, looking at things like you know the Affordable Care Act and other, um, you know, directly purchasing private insurance, if that's a huge issue for you depending on your personal and family situation, um, you know, ex explore those things and see, does it work, right? Versus to Stefan's point, the fear of a contract position. And, you know, they could call you in at 4.30 on a Friday and tell you, thanks so much for your service, we're done, right? Um, but that's, you know, in today's world, they could do that from an employee, an employee perspective too. Um, so, you know, really take advantage of that because it will open more doors for you. Sorry about that, Matthew. No, no problem, Steve. You know, to, just to hit on Steve's point, Stefan's point, Rachel's point. I mean, I think what I'm seeing out there in this market is roles are being posted on other resources uh, not just the major job boards. You're they're using other places like networking groups, this type of resource, the recruiting.work type of, of source, where we do have a posting out there for the, the types of open roles. There's other places that I think a lot of recruiters are missing the mark, not joining these local community groups or LinkedIn groups to their city and finding out about some of these undisclosed types of roles that really aren't blasted out there to the general public. So that's another piece that I think recruiters should look into. And Matthew, you're absolutely right. That's sort of where I just sort of hit the, the sweet spot of my job search in the last probably three weeks. Um, I was joining additional groups and, and leveraging my, my network 
to, hey, what groups are you part of? Or where are you posting your jobs? You know, we're all friends with other recruiters, right? <laughs> so what are they doing stuff? Most of the jobs that I've been considered for right now, I'm in the running for a few, um, are jobs that I, I yeah, 90% of them I haven't applied for yet. Like they reached out to me and I, you know, or I saw a post and reached out to a recruiter and I'm already, you know, in the fourth interview or third interview. And so great advice. Yeah. Oh, quick so, Rachel, what have you done? What have you done differently? Um, you said like 90% of the roles that you're being considered for are roles that you haven't applied for. People have linked out to, I mean, have you tried anything different on your LinkedIn profile per se that you felt has gathered you more attention? Uh, I think yes. there's a lot of people out there that might get frustrated because they hear someone talking about getting reached out to on LinkedIn and maybe they're not having the same experience. Like, what do you, are any tips that you can provide for the people listening that might help them gain their exposure to recruiters? Yes. So if you're not anyone, if you're not, you, you know, if you don't want to link with me, you don't have to. It's Rachel Couples on LinkedIn. Uh, but you can follow me and my whole profile is public. Actually, a game changer for me, just a really big game changer was just, I believe, last week. I decided, uh, you know, I've been job seeking for a few months. I was missing writing job advertisements. I know that's weird. <laughs> but I'm, just, I'm like, why don't I write... Uh, why don't I post something instead of a job advertisement? Like what's my sales pitch? Um, and I posted a picture of myself and just said, you know, if you're looking for an award-winning talent acquisition professional, blah, blah, you know, just with my experience, please reach out to me. Um, and a f other network members uh, shared it that I'm connected with that have much, I've, I'm right around like 4,000 connections, but uh, I have, I just leverage my network. Some, some of my connections have, you know, tens of thousands of followers. Um, and it was overwhelming in a good way the next like 48 hours because uh, people I didn't know that knew people that I did know were reaching out to me. Um, and I'm still, I have phone calls and meetings set up through all the way through the end of next week, just, just from that alone. The groups thing that I was talking about previously, that's something that I started about three weeks ago, more intentionally. So I think just more self-promotion. I know it might seem, or for me, it feels, uh, I had to get over that, be, you know, being worried what anybody's going to think or if it's going to seem like I'm self-serving. I need a job. I know if I get a job, I'm going to do an excellent job at it, and I'm going to help other people get a job, you know? So I just had to to get over the fear of coming across, uh, I guess, too pushy or, or too braggy about my accomplishments and experience. And that that's changed a lot for me. Question for the panel around, like that's sort of the open to work thing. I think it started off as, you know, I'm not trying to label anybody. Say, oh, you, you look needy. I've heard people say that, right? To me, given mm -hmm. the world situation, I, I don't buy into that argument at all. It's like everybody's been hit by COVID. It's not like you're out of work because you're a poor performer. I think everybody gets that, especially recruiters. So I, when people ask me you know, around that, I, I recommend people do it because it's like, even if there wasn't the pandemic going on, I don't really see a problem with it, but some people will say, you look, you look desperate to do that. Eh, kind of argue back on that one. But especially in this day and age, I'm one of those believers like, yeah, it's, Put it out there and especially if you're commenting or in groups and then you're like in linkedin how your image is there right and for every comment anything like mm -hmm. that you're looking for work and everybody gets that uh there's some area in the chat around that kind of to bring to highlight that open to work feature on here everybody on the panel you, are you and steven you've already spoken on it. rachel you have the, the matthew and stefan are you guys yeah i put that on there if i was looking or you'd recommend it to others I mean, I personally do. Like I said, I, I just turned mine on the other day. Um, and that's not that I'm necessarily looking for a job super actively. I have a great career right now, but I feel by not having that on, I might be limiting some options that might lead me to something bigger down the road. So I feel like that that's designed there to let recruiters know that you're interested in having a conversation. And part of my job is sourcing for people and that lets me know who's more likely to talk to i'm not going to bark up a bunch of trees where people you know aren't sprouting leaves essentially you know i'd rather figure out 
who wants to talk because I'm going to have a higher rate of response and potentially a, you know, a higher, higher rate from those folks who have indicated they're interested. I initially uh, had read some research. This was, gosh, this was back in like, you know, in June um, and was following some just conversations about the open to work and the, you know, putting the, the frame around your profile picture. And it was such a mixed response at the time that I didn't do it. And I tell you, I'm kicking myself now uh, for just not going for it because it, it did, like I said, it, it changed everything for me as far as I'm, I'm now getting contacted you know, by, by recruiters because it's easy to find me. I don't see the, the harm in doing that. And I hear from other recruiters that I know that are out on the job market that they don't want to look or appear like they're in the search with that type of desperate nature around their profile picture. I don't see that as a desperate type of act. And I don't think it would hurt anyone to do that. And I no. applaud LinkedIn for adding that feature. I think it's a great feature. And I think that anyone not doing it because they might be afraid of doing it, I think you, I'd encourage you to do it. You're on mute, Sean. Sorry, my bad. My dog is running around the background. There's an interesting comment in the chat. Uh, what if you're still working at a company, but you're also open to work? The question was, can they see it? I think the answer is yes. Uh, any thoughts on that? Where you, go ahead, Rachel. I was just going to say, yeah, there's a way that, so you don't have to turn on the open to work. Other recruiters will see if you're open to work, but you don't have to turn on the, you know, the little green circle and everything. So if someone, anybody who has a recruiting LinkedIn account will be able to see it, but that's it. So that's, that's without the circle, right, Rachel? Right. It's you only... choose whether you add the circle or not. Okay. Yeah. So you can, so you can indicate on LinkedIn that you're, so there's, there's a setting on LinkedIn that you could say I'm open to work and notify recruiters or be open to recruiters without the circle around your picture, right? right. So I think the question was specifically around the picture because you know as soon as I click on you, that picture right there in front of me. So I could see that it has the ready to work scoop on it, right? Uh, yeah. Initially, um, there, it, it was either LinkedIn or maybe even another job board that had a hashtag ready to work, right? And, and so that was another way that recruiters can find people by using that hashtag. So. Uh, Matt, from, a, from the other perspective of it, right? Not from the candidate looking for work right now, but from if you're leading a team and you are building, and you're one of those companies that is hiring now, what, what's your perspective or com comment around your, your position where, hey, you're a staffing leader, dealing with the situation now, hiring additional recruiters? Uh, no, good question. Um, just to introduce myself, Matt Litzak, I'm the Director of Talent Acquisition at Mimecast. We're an email security company here in Boston, but good question, Sean. I mean, I think that I've seen the market drastically switch from when I was building a team back in March when I first came to this company, where I couldn't find a recruiter to save my life in the Boston area. Everyone was working. The great recruiters were taken. And then when COVID hit, my job search for a recruiter drastically changed and I started getting a lot more traction. Uh, what I've seen recently is a lot of the people that I reached out to originally that weren't looking or passed on my opportunity have come back to me. So I'm doing anything I can to try to put them in touch with any contacts that I know of. But it's always good to follow back up with those employers that may have reached out to you originally for an opportunity back six months ago or even a year ago to just put it out there that you are still out there looking or out there looking right now and you've activated an, a job search. And I, I really think as a talent acquisition leader, I have no problem if someone reaches out to me and says, hey, look, Matt, you know, I have passed on your opportunity three months ago, six months ago, but I am in a search and I know that opportunity may not be there. Can you keep me in mind or put me in touch with somebody in your network? And I have no problem doing that. Got it. And kind of an industry question, again, for all, all panelists on this one around recruiting opportunities or hiring in general, are we seeing, like in the beginning, healthcare recruiters seem to be working themselves to death given the healthcare industry, everything going on there. Is, I, I've talked with some tech companies, they're not really being hit 
So are, are there like, is the tech industry doing just fine? If I'm looking for recruiting positions um, and I have tech recruiting background, should I be focused on that? Is healthcare started to good? Uh, is life sciences still working? Any, any comments around industries and the, the recruiting need within those industries? Absolutely. Uh, just as a, the two areas that I specifically do not have any or a ton of experience are healthcare and tech. So as a job seeker, uh, it's wonderful to see all of these, these openings, but um, there, I would say uh, more than 60% of the openings that I'm seeing are either in healthcare or tech. I agree. I think I think um, if the industry is doing well, then the recruiting aspect of that industry is doing well. Um, I regularly receive, so I have a background that includes um, tech and in the tech field, it's in the professional services. So consulting, uh, technical services, and really across the board of uh, what industries that company is supporting. So from healthcare to retail to um, CPG, logistics, finance, everything. And, um, and really it's um, the technology side of, of companies right now, even companies that aren't technology companies, the technology part of that company um, is, is very active. Um, so having, first and foremost, I don't wanna say, um, you know, I tell people I'm industry agnostic. The first thing you want to do as a recruiter is partner with the business, right? Learn the business irrespective of what that business is, okay? I've had several jobs even since 2001 in several different industries. And first and foremost, you want to partner with the business. Know what's going on, know who your customer is, because if you're going to be recruiting and staffing for them, you need to understand that. Because in the end, a recruiter is a salesperson, right? And, and we're, selling the, we're selling the company and the opportunity and the business to candidates. And then in turn, we're selling the candidate back to the business. So we have to have that understanding and knowledge base when it comes to what we're doing. So even if you're not um, coming from or have experience with a technology company, um, to understand their business and their business model um, you know, you could study up on, you know, different programming languages and things like that, or even partnering with the hiring manager for them to be able to explain to you what they're looking for. And some of those types of things uh, can help a recruiter really cross into different businesses. But right now, hot markets are hot recruiting. Steve, and Steve I have a question just uh based on what you were, were talking about. So how would, let's just use me as an example. I don't have tech experience. Um, I know tech recruiters, right? I, I know there's, there's uh, wonderful people that would give me their time. Um, but how would I set myself apart, say once I've spent time doing that, when it, you know, it's a market like this, do you think it's better to focus on less tech for someone that doesn't have tech right now? Or should they continue to try and learn more and a keep applying for those jobs too. Cause I'm finding I'm, I've been rejected <laughs> for every single tech role. Sure. So, so technology people tend to like technology people, finance people tend to like, you know, if you're not a mortgage person, then, you know, the mortgage industry doesn't even want to talk to you nine times out of 10. But um, again, it goes back to my casting your net, Rachel, and, and really, you know, do if, you know, I would say concentrate on the areas that you're familiar and experienced mm -hmm. in, but sprinkle in the other areas because there may be right. someone who is now in the tech field that came from another area and they know the companies mm -hmm. that you work for, the types of positions you recruited for, and they're like, oh my gosh, that is exactly the type of work ethic or um, experience that we're looking for to bring into this organization. And so take advantage of that. Um, when I was, I was with a retail company for almost 16 years, no technology background whatsoever. That retail company had technology recruiters, right? So I go to the director of technology recruiting and I'm like, can you teach me how to technology recruit? You know, I wanna get into the 
the tech area. And he says, sure. And he gives me a, a, a stack of documents, right? That were all around computer languages and things like that to try to educate me on, on that aspect of the business. I never read it, um, but, um, but at the same time, I did work for a technology company. I worked for a company called Infosys, which is one of the largest IT outsourcing companies in the world um, based offshore. So I had no technology company experience. I had no um, experience on a global level, working for a global company and partnering with people offshore and those types of things. It was a wonderful learning experience for me. Um, so I say to your point, Rachel, concentrate in the areas that you're most experienced, right. passionate about and know and sprinkle and explore the other opportunities too, because you never know. Would someone ever leave the corporate world for an agency world if they wanted to learn tech? I've seen it. I have yeah. seen it. But, you know, I have to say, you know, when I look for a corporate recruiter, I do look for that agency background in their career track. Because I feel that that agency background, they cut their teeth and it gives them the raw recruiting knowledge that they need to do a number of different industries like Steve was mentioning. You know, they're, they're kind of moving around from industry to industry. So I do look for that. And I've hired agency recruiters straight onto my teams direct from agencies on the corporate side. So, and seen some excellent recruiters from the agency world. So both ways. Yeah, you, I'm guessing here that if you if somebody did do that, because I think if I, wanted, if I was number of tech recruiter and I wanted to go do it, I'd try and get into an agency that focused on serving the tech industry. I'm guessing there's probably a decrease in salary. Maybe there's an uptick if they're commission based, but that's right. something everybody have to figure out. But to me that, cause it's so hardcore recruiting, you don't have to deal with anything corporate wise. It's just straight up recruiting uh, all, all day long. That would be my, my thought around that. I have no idea if agencies are hiring right now. I don't know if an agency would want a corporate recruiter to be blunt with you. Uh, in the past, they may have shy away from that. In this but area, I've I've heard I've heard that agencies are starting to hire, but they're hiring more. Uh, what agencies do? They hire more entry level. They build, right? So yeah. they're they're the lower paying roles. So you know, I think if you're willing to, depending on where you're at in your career, um, you really want to get. That's just an, it's excellent advice. And, um, it's a great idea um, to see if you can gain tech experience, you know, from the staffing or agency side. But it may be a tremendous cut in salary. Yeah, I'm guessing it would be. But if you're like two years into recruiting and you just got laid off because you're inexperienced, I'm jumping over to try and get in an agency. But if I'm five years plus, eh, I'm going to keep holding on for my, my corporate gig, what have you. I, I will come in in the earlier discussion, Stephen, around your point around 1099 work. In a, in a previous life, I was a 1099 compliance manager uh, out of Silicon Valley during the, during the good old days. If you can work the best case scenario is to have a W-2 job and do 1090 work, 1099 work on the side. That's the best financial incentive for somebody in recruiting, in my opinion, because you can do it from home. You just need a phone and a computer. So if you ever get to that spot where you're working a corporate job and you want to earn a little extra cash for yourself doing your profession, doing that on a 1099 is probably the best way to go about it. Keep a corporate job, do your 1099 work on the side. Best case scenario. That's just my thoughts on that one. Uh, so I, let me show, I wanted to share a screen real quick here again. This was the, I hope this isn't fuzzy for everybody. I just wanted to highlight this. I saw this on a, a TV this morning. This is the initial, the unemployment insurance claims as of a few days ago. I just want to highlight, it looks like we're kind of leveling off for the most part since September. And looking back before everything really hit, I think that's, I just keep waiting for that jump. I guess it's a jump downward as far as unemployment insurance claims go to get back to this world. That's what I keep hoping for we get to pretty soon. Hopefully that'll be coming back with 2021, fingers crossed. But I just thought it was interesting where this leveling off since the beginning of September going through October seems to be plateauing. Um, any, any thoughts around, I know this isn't specific to recruiting, but any thoughts is just the industry and the economy as a whole I think one of the challenges is 
um, the number of businesses that either have closed or are struggling to really see a, a like you said, like a, a plummet back to the, the pre-April numbers. Um, I think that the business world and the economy is different today um, and it will probably be different for quite some time. To add to what Steve was saying, um, just in my search alone, uh, there's an organization that I am extremely interested in. Pretty, I mean, I, I believe I'm moving to the final interview, uh, but at the end of the day, they've been transparent, depending upon what happens between now and, and uh, November, middle of November, it could change whether or not they can even afford to hire you know, a director. So I, I think that, that, that organizations are, you know, a lot of them, they laid off a lot of their recruiters and HR people in a panic in the beginning of all of this. Um, a lot of them are saying they need to either beef up their team or add, add it back, but they're, they're scared to make a decision based upon just not knowing the state of, you know, the pandemic or, or really the economy. Sort of the, the situation in the economy in the country, a quick question around remote work being so prevalent now, and that looks like it's going to be around for a while, especially in re yeah. recruiting. If you're actively competing for a position, and Rachel, this goes back to your point of, hey, work your network, engage with it. Mm -hmm. If if I live in the LA area and I'm now applying to what, hey, pretty much used to be a job in LA, but now it's remote, so the country is applying for my job pool here. I got to guess this is going to make it harder to land that job that you're trying to get because I'm guessing that it increases the talent pool and application pool or, or am I off on that? No, I think that, so what I found is yes, but it's twofold. Like I just had an interview on Friday uh, with an organization based out of New York, just in the city. Um, I'm a morning person. So it's like, I would love to work East Coast hours, you know, if I can work remotely. Um, but how I was considered for the role and got to, to the decision maker initially was through a group. So I was introduced to her first, sent her my resume and everything. Um, she reached back, you know, then I applied for the position and whatnot. And we, we scheduled that interview that I had Friday. So it's, I, I think it's all in your, your approach. You know, if you're looking to work remote, like, extend your net. Uh, I wish I would have done a lot of this stuff sooner. It never occurred to me that someone in New York might want to talk to me. Um, and I, you know, but just, if I just would have applied for the position and didn't introduce myself or I didn't do my due diligence to, you know, find who the decision maker was, then yeah, I'm probably going to be at the bottom of the stack. Something though that uh, some advice someone gave me that really helped was I removed, uh, you know, on your resume where it says, like, for me, Seattle, Washington, or, you know, I could say Phoenix, Arizona, or wherever. I, it says remote. I have a specific resume that just says remote. Um, and then I, it's got United States. Um, so they know that I, depending on whether they can hire, you know, in or out of the, of, um, the country. So they have an in-country. But that way, there's... You know, it, it's, I don't know why it works, to be honest, but it did. It was great advice. I got, I got way more responses, um, especially uh, applying for roles in the Midwest and East Coast being over here on the West Coast. When you send your resume, Rachel, you on your LinkedIn profile? No, my resume. So hopefully everybody has several versions of their resume that all tell the truth, but are tailored to different types of roles that you may be applying for. Someone mentioned previously, I'm sorry, I can't remember who, about sales. I started out in business development, actually have more experience in business development years wise than recruiting. So I have one that's more geared towards business development and customer relationships. And one that's more, you know, it's all the same information. It's just talking to, you know, that type of that recruiter of that role. And so in turn, I also have a resume that is specific to remote work and, and goes into greater length about my experience in previous roles and my ability to not only work remotely and be successful, but lead uh, remote teams successfully. So. 
Excellent. Good. I think that um, what I what another piece that a lot of the recruiters on the market are missing is that what I've always done is go into these business journals that are part of any city, start tracking companies that have landed the big VC money or those types of you know monies given to them, you know angel funding, so forth, and start following those companies. But not only that, look for the companies that are hiring a leader of talent acquisition and pinpoint those companies that are hiring the leader and then follow them within a month's time when they get that leader in place, chances are they're going to be building a team or replacing a team. And I think Absolutely. a lot of the recruiters are missing that piece to, you know, I'm reading the Boston Business Journal every day. I'm seeing companies. This company just landed this amount of money. This company... Those are the companies that are going to be building their talent teams. Yeah, and you could subscribe to those online. Like that's a really great, great point, and it's so easy. Right on your phone. Yep. Yep. If, if there's a like built in LA.com, built in Chicago, built in Austin. They they focus on those startup type companies, even though there's some big companies in there. But I know they give special highlight to the startup companies. And Crunchbase, of course, is. Yeah get on that one yeah, it's interesting to see um i was i was noticing this around even just smaller size company by smaller i mean less less than a thousand right so not small business thing like that uh they're developing dni programs so they're they're investing in that piece of it so to me it's like okay if you're building out your dni and you don't have a recruiting uh, position posted but you're investing in your your people there that might be another kind of a target for a company to start reaching in there hey, if you guys are looking for that recruiter that piece of it, it that's yeah. wonderful advice sean i i'm a diversity recruiter uh it turns out <laughs> so um i i started doing that about a month ago and i talked myself into uh virtual coffee and an interview um for positions that they knew were coming but they weren't they're not coming till january so I'm going to keep cultivating those relationships. I mean, I, gosh, I, I hope I'm back to work before January, but if I'm not, you know, yeah. there's some great opportunities out there. Well, so kind of thank you everybody. I think it was a great conversation. I know we've gone a little bit over, uh, any kind of comments in general or advice, uh, to besides keep your chin up, it's, it's coming back. There's opportunities there. I think it's more work. Than before I, I will uh, give a comment from a, a recruiter emailed me and said they're seeing uptick they're getting responses than they were three months ago but if what they used to be doing is every time they apply they get a response out of one out of three applications now it's back down to one or ten but it is kind of coming back slowly I keep wishing it would there'd be some switch to flip and hey we're back on the way we were before don't think that's going to happen but uh I do think it's going in the right direction for the most part. But any any final thoughts or comments for for the recruiters that are out there, uh, either looking for work if they're working or not, but just in general making our way to to twenty twenty one. I think that the initiative piece uh, on any recruiter's part has got to be there. You've got to be hitting the pavement every single day, including weekends. Some of yeah. these job postings are posted on the weekend. They're posted on Saturdays or Sundays. They're timed that way. So they don't have the onslaught of resumes coming in. So you've got to use your initiative and you've got to be one of the first or second resumes in the door. You have to be. And if, if you're not, you need to be following up. But I, I definitely agree. I was just talking to uh, another recruitment professional who is starting to pick up for her. She works at an agency and I was telling her, I'm you know, I'm putting in over 60 hours a week. It's like I'm, it's like I'm leading a TA team again, you know. Um, and I, I'm at seven days a week. I'm, you know, I'm not putting, I'm taking one day, one day a week where I may, but I'm, I may only spend an hour just making sure I didn't miss something. Um, and making sure I get self-care is important. Don't forget that. But um, these positions are just, they're, I mean, 10 p.m. at night and it's just being posted. You know, and remembering if they're, we're all in different time zones. So I've noticed that a lot more is happening on the East Coast and the Midwest than is happening right now uh, here in, uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest. So I, 
I'm waking up earlier. I'm getting involved in more conversations and, you know, um, whether it's on LinkedIn or in special groups or whatnot. But the one thing I would say for me is, and it, I think it's hard for all of us because we're used to being the one that, you know, we're the ones, we're the people, people, we help people. We have to normalize and, and make it like, it's okay to ask for help. At the end of the day, none of us can read minds. We all are helpers. It's what we do, right? So ask your colleagues, you know, whether they're maybe not even in recruitment, have somebody that's not even in your industry, look at your resume or share. I mean, that's what I did on LinkedIn. I just reshared that on LinkedIn a, a few minutes ago so that everybody could see it. It's up to the top. I just asked for for a job or to share my info to somebody, you know, and it's something as simple as that. Um, hopefully it's going to land me a job in the next month. I certainly hope so, Rachel. Uh, Stefan, Stephen, any last comments to add? You know, I think one thing that's important for people that are in the job search right now too, was Rachel's talked about some minor, you know, tweaks to her resume is, to figure out a way to navigate around the bots. I mean, we're increasing technology here. Every major company is putting a lot of money into being able to sort through resumes without having to put manpower into them. So it's important when you're like creating a resume, you really don't want to have one resume that you're sending out for multiple jobs. You want to make sure that you're spending the time and it is time consuming. It can be a pain in the butt, but you really want to make sure that when you find that job or that company that you want to work for, you're really studying the job description and you're adding those keywords into your resume. Because if you don't do that in today's day and age with the way technology works and, um, you know, programs like ZipRecruiter and another, a bunch of those other ones that are out there, your resume is never going to get in front of somebody. So it's very important to put keywords and really try to mirror that job description the best you can with your past experience. And I would take that one step further. I've never been a huge cover letter guy. It might be because I am still within like the first 10 years of my career. So I haven't necessarily, I've only worked at one place too. So for me, a cover letter hasn't been something I've never or ever really had to produce for a position. Um, but I'm finding that more people are sending them in. There's more value. You can really kind of show your experience and what you can bring to an organization through a brief paragraph on yourself. And that's also going to help you get your resume more to the front of the stack of people that are applying. So the, the two takeaways from what I'm saying is make sure you're really specializing or customizing your resume to the job description in which you're applying for and a cover letter. Cover letters are super important and take it one step further. Once you get yours created and you like what you have, you've proofed it. I'd recommend looking at like a third party site or if you have someone who's a designer to maybe give it a little extra juice, if you will, like you can get on Fiverr and pay $10 to have somebody really make a nice looking resume from what you've provided. I think there's a lot of value in doing that in a competitive job market. So from my perspective, a few things. One is um, I encourage the people who are on this, um, in this meeting to send us LinkedIn requests, right? To those of us that are on this panel um, so that we can connect. Um, I kind of coddle my LinkedIn connections um, I don't have like over 5,000, although people tell me, you're a recruiter, you should have over 5,000. Um, my connections in LinkedIn personally know me. I've spoken to them not too long ago. And so if I am going to make an introduction, they're not like Steve Rosenblum. I, I haven't talked to him in six months, right? So there's value in having those connections and value in your connecting with us to make those introductions, especially if there's an organization or someone that you want to do some networking with. Um, a couple of things I mentioned earlier, one is cast your net as wide as you can and you're bound to catch a fish. So don't leave any stone unturned, don't leave any organization, any industry, any level of opportunity. Um, you know, if you're going for that director job, great. Some organizations have managers, they don't have directors, right? Some have VPs, they don't have directors. So don't hold yourself back. If you think you meet the qualifications and it's an, a position of interest to you, um, you know, throw your hat in the ring. And the other thing that I mentioned, and several, you know, some of us have, have mentioned on this is follow up, okay? Make sure that you don't apply for the 
I hate it when somebody says, I applied for the job and nobody called me. Well, that's not job search, that's job application, which is great. Um, somebody once asked me, what if it says no phone calls, please? Um, as, as much as it, it pains me to say, that's for everybody else. Set yourself apart from, from the other people who are getting lost in the black hole of HR, right? The black hole of that applicant system or that job search. Uh, and the way to do that is to do your research, do your homework, follow up, um, don't stalk, but you know, have some, some diligent methodology in following up to try to make a connection there and get a response versus sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. That's, that's, that's my advice. Excellent. Can I, can to I Stephen's on point, oh, sorry. Yeah, let me jump in here real quick and I'll send it over to you, Rachel. So to Stephen's point, a couple of years ago, I applied for a position with a media company that I really had no business being in contention for. It was a mid-level uh, management position with Vice Media. And I probably would never have gotten to talk to anybody. I probably wouldn't have gotten flown to New York to interview with them. Had I have not gone the extra mile, which Stephen is talking about, um, I went ahead and I made a great looking resume. I even had Fiverr go over it and had some, you know, people that are more creative than I really, you know, make it look nice. And I figured out who was hiring for the role, who that leader was. And I sent them all a full packet with like my information, my cover letter, my resume. And that ultimately led to me getting to a final interview with the company. Um, you know, I didn't end up getting an offer, but it still brought me there. I got to meet the team and it was because I took the initiative to do what other people weren't doing. Most people were probably just clicking on LinkedIn, easy apply, putting the resume in and moving on to the next company. Um, you know, if you want to get those really good jobs that you're looking for, you got to go out and get them. You got to go out and take them or somebody else is going to. Yeah, I just wanted to add anybody that does want to connect. I, I can't speak for everybody here, but I'm pretty sure they'll agree that uh, connect with me. I'm happy to even set up, set some time up to do, you know, 15, 30 minute conversation. I've been able to, as a job seeker, talk to a lot of other job seekers during this time. And it might seem like, why would you do that? You want to talk to people that are hiring, but um, I've been able to, because we're all looking, we've been able to refer each other to other roles. So, um, and brainstorm. So I'm happy to do that with, with anyone who's currently uh, recruiting a job, a recruiter that's job seeking. In, in the spirit of, of networking on the group website, recruiting.org, I do list out like chapters or locations and all the members and then I'll post these recordings and all the attendees and they all have direct links back to each other's LinkedIn profile. So if it's a, I'm trying to aid everybody and trying to connect with each other. But if you're looking at different sessions that we do, different interests, you can see all the other recruiters who have that same interest and attended and click right over to their LinkedIn profile. Uh, again, the spirit of networking. I couldn't agree more with, with, with connecting when I, every job I've gotten since 2005 was through a referral. So it was never applying. It was always new business, new opportunities because I was ref referred into it. So I always, to everybody's point, stay connected with the people you worked in before. Let them know when you're, when you're looking for opportunities and everything like that. It's everybody gets it and this is our business. So I think it's all fair game. All right. Uh, hey, thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate it. It's, it's a tough topic and tough times, but I, I think we're all getting through it one way or another. And uh, hopefully there's light at the tunnel. I think there is. It's, Hopefully we'll get there sooner than later. So thank you every, uh, very much, everybody. I'll let everybody go. Have a great weekend soon here, and I'll talk to everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks, Sean. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Sean.